uh, in my view, uh, this scheme is faulty on almost all counts. Uh, for example, this idea that European history is just a catalogue of achievements is quite wrong. Uh, in European history, uh, one meets with wonderful achievements, it's true. Uh, but equally, terrible disasters, crimes, follies, um, uh, just the book of the 20th century, the two great um, evil movements of the 20th century, fascism and communism, came out of, of Europe. Um, secondly, Europe has never been confined and fine to Western Europe. It's true that in the 19th, early 20th century, uh, Western countries, especially the imperial countries, the countries with empires like Britain and France, uh, Spain, to a lesser extent uh, Germany, it's true that these were uh, very important, not only politically, but also culturally. Uh, but it's nonsense to pretend that the rest of Europe either doesn't exist or doesn't count. Uh, and on the religious score, uh, it's true that uh, Christianity had a central place in European civilization for many centuries. Uh, but the ancient Greeks and Romans, where the course begins, were not Christian. Homer, Aristotle, Plato were not Christian. Uh, there's a long pagan tradition in Europe. Uh, equally, uh, among the, uh, uh, the three um, you know, monotheistic religions, Christianity, Hinduism, and Islam, all three are present for long periods of time uh, throughout European history. And to cut them out is, I think, a, uh, a caricature of reality. My second uh, approach to European history is what I call great power history. Uh, it's a, an approach which can be met in many traditional British textbooks. The sort of textbook that I will learn from 50 years ago as a schoolboy in England. But not only in Britain. Uh, this approach uh, concentrates all its attention on half a dozen powerful countries great powers, and in all the rest. Uh, so, in the 16th century, Spain is the great power of Europe, and all the attention is focused on that. In the 17th, 18th century, up to Napoleon, France is the focus of attention. The great power. Then comes the turn of Great Britain, uh, eventually Germany, and quite often Russia uh, in the 20th century is included in this view of great power history. If you take power as the criteria of analysis, it's obvious that uh, the subject matter of great power history is all going to be about wars, battles, and of course diplomacy, the relations between the, uh, between the great powers. Um, in other words, history is reduced to a catalogue of winners and losers. It's all about 
how particular powers become top dog at a particular moment and fade and are replaced by somebody else, either through um, military battles or uh, sometimes uh, diplomatic political success. Uh, and battles and treaties are the, uh, the bread and butter of this approach. Uh, one should also say that this approach encourages the cult of powerful people, uh, not necessarily good people or beautiful people or people who achieve great things, uh, but people who wield power. Hence, uh, great generals, great statesmen, Great politicians. Napoleon, Bismarck. But equally, um, as it were, the evil geniuses of power history, uh, to be fair, Hitler and Stalin. Uh, it's a view of history which is particularly amoral. Uh, it Praises the winners, the people praises the powerful, and it leads the weak on one side. Uh, once again, in my view, this approach to history is very mistaken. Uh, when you think about it, the great majority of European countries are not great powers. I mentioned 45. European nations at the present time, most of them are not and never have been top dogs. Uh, but that doesn't mean to say they're insignificant or not worth studying. Uh, the typical European country would not be one of the countries that has been hugely powerful time, it would be some middle ranking country. Uh, Denmark comes to mind in, in the uh, newspaper last week I saw that uh, Denmark had the happiest po population uh, in the whole world. Uh, but I challenge you, see if you can find in an average textbook of European history anything about the history of Denmark. And it's not there because Denmark, the small uh, exception in the uh, Middle Ages, was not a great power. My third example of pan European historical approaches is Marxist history. Uh, uh, Marxism. materialism, a philosophy based on a, a view of history, uh, giving primacy to uh, economic, in particular to socio-economic changes. Uh, I should say two things about this to begin with. Uh, first, Marxism has many variants. There is no one form of Marxism uh, which um, uniquely applied. The second thing which may uh, be relevant here is that the ideology of the Soviet Union was not Marxism. Uh, it was a derivative of Marxism called Marxism-Leninism uh, which if Karl Marx had seen, he would have turned in his grave. Uh, it was contradictory uh, to many of the uh, assumptions and values that Karl Marx held dear. Uh, 
Uh, nonetheless, Marxism, as opposed to Mar uh, Marxism Leninism, had many virtues. One is that it claimed to be universal. The, the principles it put forward were said to apply to all societies. Secondly, it was a grand sweep. Uh, it was a theory that attempted to explain the whole of history from prehistorical times uh, right up to the uh, present day. And it divided uh, history into <coughs> periods, one it called tribalism, tri uh, prehistoric tribal society, then slave owning society in the ancient world of Greeks and Rome, uh, then the period of feudalism, which is typical of the Middle Ages, then the period of capitalism in early modern Europe, then the period of socialism, uh, and finally the period of communism, which was something in the future, something not yet achieved. Uh, and in the Marxist view, societies move through what's called a spiral of, pro uh, of progress uh, ever upwards through these different uh, levels until in a sort of mystic, semi-religious vision they would arrive at the state of communism. Uh, Karl Marx himself uh, never lived to see the great influence that his theory had. Uh, he was a German, of course. Uh, he lived most of his life in London. I once used to sit in the same seat in the British Museum uh, where he uh, sat for 25 years. And uh, if you're interested in educational finance, Karl Marx was a finance by a rich capitalist called Friedrich Engels, who owned a factory in Manchester. Uh, but once again, uh, this pan European scheme has many drawbacks. Um, one drawback is that it is, uh, if you look at it, very closely European. It claims to be used, uh, universal, but Marx was very typical of his time. He, in effect, he looked almost exclusively uh, at, at Europe, uh, and uh, he didn't provide the universal scheme uh, that, um, uh, that one would hope for. Equally, the Marxist scheme uh, leaves aside many uh, uh, important aspects of, of human life <coughs> which can't be easily linked to, um, to society and economics. Uh, and of course, any universal view of history needs to see all aspects of human life as a whole. Uh, I should just say, however, um, having mentioned Marxism, Leninism, the ideology of the Soviet Union, uh, which was here until not too long ago, probably you young people can't remember it. I can remember it very well. Uh, and I have to say, the first time I ever read anything about the history of Azerbaijan, was in the Soviet textbook. Uh, and I remember thinking that uh, these Soviet textbooks uh, were very ideological, uh, very political uh, in nature, but they also had a very wide spread. Uh, and 
the first thing I ever read about this part of the world um, came from uh, one sort of Soviet textbook. Now, if I may, let me turn to national histories. Uh, which every country uh, possesses uh, and encourages. Uh, they are driven by the belief, and uh, I stress the word belief, the belief in nationhood and in the rights of nations, including the right to control their own nation state. They are pursued on the one hand by governments uh, and on the other hand by the leaders of stateless nations who are very often fighting against um, governments, against ruling empires. Uh, in the mid 19th century, when this form of history came into fashion, uh, there were three prominent stateless nations. Uh, one was Germany. The German state was only created in 1871. Uh, the other was Italy. Uh, the Italian state also uh, was completed in 1870 and the Risorgimento, the resurrection Slogan in 
accept um, things that happened in the meantime. Um, and, but the, there's this constant um, repetition of uh, ownership of the land and foreign occupation. So in the uh, uh, centuries of history, the national territory has somehow been lost it's been overrun by, by foreigners, it's been occupied by empires, uh, and uh, throughout all these invasions and occupations, the nation's still there on, on the land and will at some point emerge to claim it back. Um, and this is how uh, most national history books are written. It's just about this one piece of territory and everything that happened um, from the beginning to the end on that one little patch. A second issue that is that of national consciousness. Um, this is concerned with uh, the, the way that a community of people uh, become aware of their identity, knowing who they are, they are conscious of being a, a, a nation, not just a, a tribe or a group of people who happen to, to live and exist. Uh, and the drivers of national consciousness uh, are for education, uneducated people can't even know who they are. Who they are. Uh, language. Uh, language has been a very important factor in national consciousness, and many nations can't imagine people of their nationality not being able to speak the national language. So you have education, you have language, you have religion, quite often. A particular nationality is connected with a particular religion or branch of a religion. And then comes all the elements of culture. Uh, literature, music, uh, performance, theater, um, all the things which make people aware of, of who they are. Uh, and this the story of arousing the awareness of national identity is a vital part of uh, the national story. Uh, thirdly, is the issue of the struggle of independence. As I said, very often the national territory is occupied by somebody or other, some empire, some invader, some foreign power. Uh, and the political history of the nation is concerned with this struggle uh, to liberate themselves from foreign, uh, foreign oppression. And almost of necessity, uh, this struggle is prominent in the story, the struggle against the ruling power empires, uh, neighbors, uh, people who are, for some reason, on the national territory and should not be there. Uh, the struggle for independence uh, takes many forms. Um, for example, it often takes a cultural form. Uh, the ruling empires tend to impose their culture on the people over whom they rule. The British Empire would try to teach all its subjects English. Um, the Russian Empire would teach people Russian. The Spanish Empire would teach people Spanish. And the national struggle against this uh, is concerned with 
protecting and developing the national culture against that of the ruling empire. Another form is economic. Uh, all great empires have economic interests of their own. They uh, aim to benefit economically from having a great empire. And those interests are often seen as contrary to the economic interests of the constituent nation. Uh, but very often, the struggles for independence uh, take a military form, fighting battles, driving out the, uh, the occupier, taking possession uh, of, the, uh, of the national land. And of course, nobody has been <coughs> more uh, devoted to um, the struggle for national independence if necessary by military means uh, than the Poles. And the fact that the Poles have survived is something I think of a, a miracle. Now, in order to understand all these matters, I think comparison is a useful tool. And uh, if I had time, uh, I would uh, uh, present the comparison between the history of Azerbaijan and that of, of Poland. Uh, we may be able to have time after that I have prepared a for a handout uh, for that. Uh, but let me just um, list some of the similarities. Uh, first of all, if we go back to the 18th century, uh, both Poland and Azerbaijan were partitioned between empires. Uh, Azerbaijan, I think, first. Part of it was remained in Persia. Uh, you call it South Azerbaijan. Uh, the Northern Azerbaijan here was uh, annexed by the Russian Empire. Now, somewhat later, after 1773, Poland, which was a much bigger country in those days, was partitioned among three empires. Um, the <coughs> eastern territories of Poland were taken into Russia, so that Warsaw became a city of the Russian Empire, like that good. Uh, the southern parts of Poland, like Kraków, were taken into the Austrian Empire, <coughs> and the western part of Poland, like the city of Poznań, or Gdańsk, uh, became part of Russia, and later of the, uh, the German Empire. Uh, both of our countries were uh, deeply affected by the First World War. Poland was actually in the middle of the Russo-German front of the First World War. Uh, Azerbaijan was not in the middle of the fighting to begin with, but very adjacent to the Russo-Ottoman front. And the outcome of the First World War uh, is explains what happened later. After the First World War, both of our two countries had a period of independence. Uh, Azerbaijan, a very short one, uh, less than two years. Uh, I've seen in the newspapers that they're celebrating the, uh, uh, the anniversary of, of that. Uh, Poland also established its independence in 1918, uh, but that independence lasted for only uh, 20 years. In 1939, it was crushed by the Nazi Soviet Pact. Um, both countries, uh, after the crushing of their period of independence, were brought into the Soviet sphere. So the Soviet Socialist Republic of Azerbaijan was in the 
Soviet sphere. I think Soviet Union is 1924, um, but uh, a period of whatever 70 years. Uh, people's Poland, not in the Soviet Union, but in the Soviet black bloc, lasted uh, a shorter period of time. And finally, both of our two countries gained independence at the time when Soviet power was collapsing. Poland, uh, technically in 1990, and Azerbaijan in 1991. I wish I had more time to talk about that. But let me uh, conclude by three uh, conclusions, three comments about um, how one can reconcile the interests of broad general histories and more narrow national histories. Um, the first thing is how to study the great powers. Uh, one shouldn't, in my view, just look at these empires um, and look at them from the point of view of the rulers uh, and how the, they, the rulers had to deal with neighbours and war and conflicts and diplomacy. One look, needs to look at the rule as well as the rulers, the people who are ruled by them uh, as well as the, uh, the perspective of the rulers. And very often this means looking at, uh, uh, on the one hand, the, the central imperial power, should we say, the British Empire in London, and then looking at one or more of the countries that were ruled from London. And the obvious example is Ireland. Ireland was part of the United Kingdom uh, throughout the 19th century when the British Empire was, was at its height, but Ireland was struggling for its independence throughout, throughout that time. Uh, the second thing, um, in addition to studying our own region, I think we should try to study subjects in which we have no interest and from which we are emotionally free. Um, of national history that is doing identity. Uh, and it's very difficult to separate our feelings from uh, the events that we read about. But if you choose some subject which is thousands of miles away, then it's quite a remedy uh, and a, a, an opportunity to uh, analyze uh, without emotion. Thirdly, uh, in order to understand the roots of conflict, we need to study the history of our neighbours. And here I'll just mention the, uh, the Polish experience, because in the 20th century there's no nation which has suffered from more conflicts uh, from uh, non uh, their neighbours than uh, Poland. Uh, I said on many occasions that um, <coughs> Poland, which had Hitler as one neighbour and Stalin as another, was in the worst predicament on the face of the globe. Uh, but now that the conflict, the historic conflict of the 20th century is finished, history is an important subject for uh, uh, understanding and overcoming past conflict. And in Poland a great deal has been done to understand Polish-German relations, Polish-Jewish relations, Polish-Russian relations, and the urgent one at the present time which has not been well treated today is Polish-Ukrainian relations. Uh, there's a big debate in Poland at the moment about the wartime massacres in Polhynia when very large numbers, hundreds of thousands of Poles were massacred uh, in uh, 
Ukraine and uh, its painful subject that is only now uh, being addressed. And so the, the final word will be this, according to how history is taught, history can be divisive or it can be a great healer. Starting, of course, from, from Polish territory, which they 
stayed in 1939, the biggest military operation in European history. Uh, and through Barbarossa, the whole of Poland was under the control of the Nazis. Uh, this is when the Jewish Holocaust occurred. Uh, Poland was the country where the greatest number of Jews lived. It was the only uh, major country in Europe where Jews had not been persecuted and was, uh, had not been driven out. For example, Jews were driven out of England in the 13th century, out of France, out of Spain, out of um, Germany. Uh, Poland was a great reservoir of, of, of Jewish people, uh, and they were wiped out by the Nazis, who occupied the whole of the, uh, the land. And then, as you know, after Stalingrad and Kursk, the Red Army drove the Germans back all the way to Berlin. The result was that the whole of Poland became part of the Soviet sphere. Eastern Poland was re-annexed to the Soviet Union, uh, and the western part of Poland became the Polish People's Republic, which lasted from 1991. And that's the quickest summary I can give. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to ask your attitude toward communism. What is, is there any advantages, advantage to have a communism in, in the Soviet Union? The key thing to understand about the Bolsheviks uh, and their ideology, they were a tiny minority. They were not <coughs> even the main socialist party in Russia. They were a minority of a minority. They called themselves the Bolshe Bolsheviki, the majority. Absolutely untrue. Uh, and Leninism was concerned with the mechanisms whereby a very small group can take power in a very big country. So, um, were there any advantages? Uh, I'm sure you can find some. Um, you have to make a list, and I'm sure the disadvantages will be twice as big as the advantages. Okay, very good play of last names. So, thank you very much. For